doing this morning? Doing good? Made it out here and man we are so excited for this new series that we are kicking off called The Climb. Who here has ever been kind of rock climbing, mountain climbing? I've never done anything but it looks really fun, right? Like it looks, it looks, looks a little dangerous but it, but it looks pretty fun. But before we jump into our new series, I want to let you know that we are adjusting our service times. And so for you, 9 o'clock is going to stay. You don't need to worry. But I know sometimes, depending upon schedules, you may come to our second service that right now is at 11 o'clock. Um, and we're going to be adjusting that service and changing it and moving it up to 1030. Uh, we have several volunteers, um, many who serve two, two um, services, um, both at the 9 and the 11, and there's just too big of a gap in between, and people are having to stay for 30 minutes in between, and our parking lot fits enough vehicles to have everyone here, and, and it'd be nice to have you guys be able to pass the 11 o'clock or the second service as they're coming in, and, and so we're going to tighten that up a little bit. Um, it, it will really help out our, our volunteers and, and just... Um, with our, with our times of everything that we have. So um, that's going to start on the first Sunday in March. So I'm giving you plenty of notice. But if you plan to come to the second service in March, it will be at 1030. So just to make aware of that. So we are kicking off this series called The Climb, where we're going to be taking a look at really how we are called to climb, to grow in our walk with God. And I believe kind of like every step that we take, that we can grow and, and climb to new heights and things that God has for us. So, man, that's my prayer for you over these next four weeks, is really that you um, grab a hold of what God has and, and, and ascend to the new heights that he has for you. Next week, it will be talking about the struggle, how, you know, every kind of climb, every trek, every, you know, every time you go out and, and you at attempt to do something and to grow, that there's going to be a struggle. And what do we do with those struggles? Um, two weeks from today, we are having our Global Compassion Summit, and we're going to be talking about missions and hearing from several of our missionaries via video and talking about how we need to adjust to the altitude. That if you're climbing, especially a mountain, and, and you get to certain altitudes, you need to adjust to the altitude before, and, and, um, before you go. You can't climb too quickly, too fast, um, because you need to, uh, need to adjust to those altitudes. And then we're going to close out this series talking about the view from the peak. Man, it, it, there's just something about getting to the top and having this nice, beautiful view. Well, then what? <laughs> Right? You're just kind of like, well, I enjoy the view, but now what? So we're going to talk about, um, you know, what do we do when we get to the peak, when we accomplish something that God has asked us to accomplish, then where do we go from here? Well, today, I'm going to be talking to you about essentials to the climb. Essentials to the climb. And I have, you know, several um, kind of uh, uh, um, pieces of equipment that you need to climb. And the first one is a, a carabiner. And maybe you've used one, heard one. They have like, you know, this carabiner, what you do is you feed it through a rope and it allows you to clip onto something and it won't undo on you. The last thing you want is your rope, rope coming undone when you're hanging off of a rock face, right? Like you, you want to make sure that I am secure. And, and so that's what the, the carabiner does. Um, and then we have some shoes so you want you want some uh, you know you need some good hiking shoes that you don't want to lose your tread right you don't want to be hiking up and you know have no tread so you want something that has um, you know some good treads on it that you won't lose your grip while you're climbing um, what else do we have here um, oh a belay a belay though these are these are cool so you actually feed oh that's why I'm there we go. Turn this around a little bit. That when you feed the rope through a belay, that it actually acts as a brake. 
and, and you can feed it through, and, um, and then you actually pull in the rope, and you can break. And it's actually what they use when you can actually propel, repel off of rock faces or buildings. You, you see those cool movies where all the you know, um, special forces are repelling out of helicopters or off of buildings, and, and they kind of stop. They're using a belay that allows them to you know, break on, on the rope. Uh, what else do we have here? Oh, a harness. You don't, you don't want one of these. Like you're climbing up a rock mountain. This is what the rope is connected to. And, and it's a harness that you put on that you can clip everything to. So, again, to keep you safe. What else we got? Oh, this is fun. Look at this thing. Got to be careful. I almost. So this is like a, a pick where you uh, attach it to, you know, uh, a piece of rope, and, and you throw, and you swing it, and you throw it up, and it uh, clips onto, uh, clips onto, you know, a rock face or maybe ice, and it kind of, you know, gets lodged in, and you use that so that you can, uh, you know, again, repel or climb up a mountain. It kind of, you know, hooks into the rock and gives you some extra added, um, oh, see, I can't even, I can't even get this back off. There's too many clips here. Well, oh, last is a compass. You want to know where you're going, right? You don't want to get out in the middle. Uh, you're climbing. You, you know, compass obviously allows you to know, hey, I'm heading north, south, east, west, whatever it is. Allows you to know where you're going. And so these are essential pieces of equipment that when you're climbing, when you're hiking, when you're climbing a mountain or a rock face, that, that you're going to want most, if not all, of these pieces of equipment so that you can get to the spot where you want to go. You, you get to that peak. You can see that view. Well, as disciples, that there are essential pieces of equipment. There's essential pieces um, that we need in our life if we're going to be the man or woman of God that he's called us to be. There's essential pieces, um, you know, that we need so that we can be a disciple that God has called us to be. That we can um, ascend, that we can grow, that we can become, again, the man or woman of God that he's called us to be. There's important pieces that we need on this journey with God. So we need to ask ourselves, do I possess the proper equipment and supplies needed to be a disciple? See, the life of a disciple, it's incredibly difficult. Right? It, it requires some essential qualities, tools, so that I can be effective as a mom, as a dad, as a husband, as a wife, as a business owner, as an employee. If I want to be effective as a believer, I, I need to make sure that I have the proper tools necessary. So what are the essentials to being a disciple? What are those essentials that I need to make sure that I have in my life? Well, we're going to be in Luke chapter 14. And in Luke chapter 14, I kind of want to give you a little bit of backstory here. Jesus, he's, he's, he's doing his thing. He, he's traveling around. He's healing people. He's casting out demons. He's, he's doing all the things that Jesus does. And because he's doing all these things, a crowd is gathering. A crowd begins to gather and follow Jesus. But the thing about this crowd is they knew Scripture. So this crowd knew that a Messiah was coming. All right, this crowd knew Messiah was coming, and, and so they knew or hoped that Jesus was going to be this Messiah, but where they had it wrong was they thought that Jesus was going to bring an earthly kingdom. So their hopes was that Jesus was going to overturn the Roman Empire. So Rome ruled Israel at the time. And they've been under the Roman rule, and they believed that Jesus was going to establish his kingdom because they knew Scripture. They just got it, just interpreted a little bit wrong. And, and so they were like, all right, Jesus, he's the man. Like, no one has done anything like this, and he is the Messiah. He's the one. He's going to bring a kingdom. He's going to overthrow the Roman government, and we're going to have, you know, we're going to go back to the days of King David, and it's going to be great. And so these crowds of people, they're following Jesus, thinking any time now he's going to overthrow that Roman government and we're going to go back to the great days of ruling ourselves and being Israel, not having to worry about the Romans. And it was great. They, they wanted in on whatever Jesus was going to do. They are like, to them, like, Jesus was our ticket. Like, I want to be close to Jesus so when he establishes this kingdom, like, I can get, like, a high place in Jesus' kingdom. And, and so... We read then, so this is all going on. Jesus walking, crowds follow him, getting excited. 
And in Luke 14, verse 27, Jesus turns to the crowd and he said, Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. <laughs> See, in this time, the cross did not have the same sentimental value that it does to believers and Christians today. In fact, that statement, I'm sure, horrified the listeners. Like, absolutely horrified that Jesus would say, whoever does not pick up their cross and carry it and follow, cannot, and follow me cannot be my disciple. Because in that time, in the Roman world, before a man died on a cross, that's how they you know, executed uh, criminals, was on a cross, he had to carry the cross to the place of his execution. So not only was he, was he going to go through the most brutal death possible, but he had to carry his own cross to the very place he was going to be executed. And everyone knew this. This was not a secret. This was not a myth. This was not, well, I've heard about it. Like, they've seen it. So if the fact that Jesus was telling them to carry their cross, I'm sure horrified them. You see, no one carried a cross for fun. No one had a picture of a cross in their room. No one had, you know, cross jewelry back then. Think about it today, like, like you wouldn't have a picture of an electric chair, right? An electric chair symbolizes the death penalty. Like you're not going to wear an electric chair around your neck. Like that would have been the same thing to those Jews back then. Like this was not a great picture. You, when you picture the cross in that time, it, it would just symbolize death and torture, the first hearers of Jesus did not need an explanation of what the cross was. They knew it was an unrelenting instrument of torture, death, and humiliation. If someone took up his cross, he never came back. He took up his cross and he carried it to the place of his ex execution. It was a one-way journey. So first, if we want to be a disciple... We want to make sure we have the proper tools. One of those tools is we need to make sure that we die to ourself. We need to learn to die to ourself and trust God with your life fully, completely. You see, when you're rock climbing, one of the, one of the, thing, one of the pieces of equipment that you trust is your harness. You have this harness on. Susie suggested that I try to put this on. I'm like, nah, I don't think so. I, I I, if I get it on, there's a good chance I'm not going to get it off. And, and so I'm not going to fumble through that. Sorry, hon. And, but this harness, you put it on. I barely know which way is what, which way, which way it goes. But one of these loops here, uh, the rope is going to go through. And if you slip, if your grip kind of, you know, you slip out on your grip and you let go, this harness is attached to a rope that's attached to the mountain. It is going to catch you. It's going to catch you and it's going to save your life. Man, we need to learn to trust God with our lives. Too often, we head out into life without the harness of, of, of Jesus in our lives. See, this harness will save your life on the rock wall. When we trust God, it's actually going to save your life when you trust him with every part of your being. See, Paul says this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, Paul says, it's no longer I that lives, but, but it's Christ that lives in me. Can you say that about yourself this morning? Can I say, you know what, hey, it's no longer I that lives, but it, it's Christ that lives in me. Like, it's Christ that lives in me. It's, it's Christ that I've trusted my life with. That it's not my plans, it's not my desires anymore, but Lord, it's your plans, it's, it's your desires, it's, it's your thoughts. Does, does Christ live and control, and, and, and do you give control to God? Because he's not going to take it. It's something that we willingly need to give over. Say, God, you can have control of my life. Where you go, where you lead me, I will follow. See, too often we look to dying to self as a bad thing. It's not. Dying to self is not a bad thing. Because sometimes, so um, Susie mentioned how about six years ago we resigned at our church as where we were youth pastors in Illinois, about 40 minutes outside of Chicago. 
And when I knew that God was calling me to be a lead pastor, I began praying and, and, and we applied to many churches. And, and I, we, I, I said to Susie, I said, you know what, I really don't care where we go. I just want to follow the calling of God. But I applied to everywhere except for the Northeast and the Northwest. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, mm, no, I, I was born and raised in Canada. I've, you know, dealt with the cold my whole life, and, and, and I'm okay. So I didn't apply to any churches in the Northeast or the Northwest. And, and slowly, uh, as, you know, the, I went through several interview processes with several churches, and just nothing was working out, nothing's working out. And I said to Susie, I said, well, I said, I think we might need to open up our horizons. I think God's closing some doors. And, and so I know I might not be excited about going um, back, or not back, we were in Chicago, but going further north into the northeast, I said, but I feel like it's something that, you know, maybe that's where God is calling us. There's a reason nothing else is working out. And so we began applying to different churches, and then we, you know, saw this church and, and applied. And let me tell you, I, I died to my plans, because my plans was like South Texas or Florida, <laughs> Like, that was like, Lord, like, I want to pastor a church right on the beach. Like, I know you have one for me. But I was like, you know what? My plans, my thoughts, my desires, they pale in comparison to you. Sure, it might have been nice, but you know what? I look back at the last five years and watching my girls grow up here and, and develop into beautiful young ladies and you know, as, as Susie and I have been able to pastor and, and love you guys, like there's nothing that I would change. At the time, it felt like I was dying to myself. But let me tell you, there's no place I'd rather be than right here in Marcy, New York, leading this great church of people who love God and, and who love people. You see, at the time, it might feel like you're dying to self, but when you kind of get through that and say, God, I'm just going to trust you, I promise you, you'll never regret it. You see, nothing about what Paul said about, you know, about that scripture I read in Galatians that, or, um, yeah, in Galatians, where it says that it's no longer I that lives, but it's you that lives in me. Like, there's nothing about what Paul says that suggests half-hearted Christianity. There's nothing about it that suggests half-hearted Christianity. See, it's all or nothing. No holds bar. I'm jumping in both feet. Lord, I'm going to die to myself, my desires, my thoughts, my plans, and I'm going to give it to you. Lord, what do you have for my life? What do you have for my future? What do you have for my family, for my marriage, for my kids? I'm going to trust you with everything. And this is what Jesus was trying to get across to the crowds where they said, you have to take up your cross and then you have to follow me or you can't be my disciple. Jesus was saying, you need to die to yourself and you need to trust me. Yeah, you symbolize and what you think of as the cross right now, it's a horrible way to die and it's gloom, it's torture and you have all these negative feelings about the cross, but just wait. Just wait. And Jesus changed everything when it came to the cross. Because now the cross is a symbol of grace, of love, and forgiveness. It's going to cost you to follow him. But God wants you to die to yourself and trust him with everything. The second essential that we need to be a disciple, we find in verse 28. And it says this. It says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? See, Jesus here, he's like, hey, you better figure this out. This is something that, is this something that you really want to do because you're not going to lay a foundation and realize, hey, I, I'm not able to finish it. If you want to be my disciple, you're going to have to be committed to the cause. Like, you're going to have to put some money in. You have to figure out, hey, can I finish this project? And and I want to talk about being committed to the cause. See, when you're rock rock climbing and you are uh, using a belay and you run that belay through the rope and, 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 and it's attached to the top of the rock face and you're sitting there and you're trying to figure out, man, can I, can I, can I do this? You're putting... Your commitment to this belay that it will stop you if you pull that rope. You pull that rope in the right way that it is going to stop you. You are committed to climbing and I'm putting my trust in this little gadget that works great. 
But man, there is a commitment that you make when you're hanging off of a rock face, you're hanging onto a rope, and that rope is on that belay. It's a commitment. Are you committed to the cause of Christ? Are you committed to the things that God has for you? See, too often, we give the enemy just a little bit. We're like, God, I've given you so much. I'm going to give you the majority of my life. There's a story of a man a couple hundred years, a hundred years ago. He wanted to sell his home. He was fairly wealthy. He wanted to sell his home. And he decided, you know what, I'm going to sell for $2,000. And this poor man, he didn't really have a lot of money. He says, hey, I want to buy your home. I love it. It's beautiful. I just don't have $2,000. Um, how about 1000 Will you take a thousand? That's fifty percent. And the, and the guys like the homeowners like, man, I don't know, fifty percent, thousand. I'll tell you what, I'll sell you the home for a thousand dollars. But there's a nail right above the doorway. I want to keep ownership of that nail. You can have the whole house. I just want that one nail. And the and the guy that's buying it's like one nail. Sure. You can have the one nail. I got the rest of the house. So this new owner, he buys the rest of the, he buys it, he moves in, he's loving his home. Well, a few years later, the, the previous owner, he decides, I want my house back. Like, I've gone, I've traveled, I've done some things, but I love that house, and, and I want my house back. So I go, he goes back to the guy, and he said, listen, <clears throat> I want to buy my house back. Um, I, I decided, I've changed my mind. And this new owner is like, well, no, I, I, no, it's mine. Sorry, you, you sold it to me. It's over. So the previous owner, he's like, well, I got that one nail. So he pulls the nail out just a little bit, about halfway. And then he goes and, and he shoots a raccoon, hangs the dead carcass of the raccoon on the nail over the door. And so this owner, the owner now has to walk by this dead carcass of this dead animal every single day. Day after day, it is stinking. It is rotting. Flies are swarming it. it is, the stench is just unbelievable. Until finally, the stench fills the house. And the, the, the new owner is finally is like, hey, you know what? I'll sell you the house back. Just because he gave him one nail. You see, too often we think because, God, I'm giving you the majority. I'm giving you so much of my life. But the problem is, is God wants all of it. Because when you give the enemy a foothold, and you give the enemy just a little bit to play with, man, he can ruin your life. He can ruin everything that God has done in your life and through your life, your marriage, your kids. Your, he can ruin so much when you allow the enemy to have just a little foothold. We need to make sure that we don't give the enemy anything, that we are committed to the cause of Christ, that we give him everything that he has of our, of our lives, of our future. And let me tell you, it can be scary. It can be scary, uh, you know, as that verse said and, and about Paul, like, hey, it's no longer I, but Christ, it's you that lives in me. I'm going to trust you with everything. God, I'm going to give you control. I'm going to give you my future. It can be scary. But in reality, let me tell you, the scariest times of my life has been when I've walked outside of the plans of God. When I've taken control of the plans and I've made my own decisions that I thought were best for me. Those have been the scariest times of my life. The most peaceful times of my life is when I'm like, all right, God, you're in charge. I'll follow you. Might not make sense, but I'm going to follow you. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to make the decisions that I feel like you're asking me to make. And those are the times that I have peace. Those are the times that might seem a little scary at first, but, man, they always work out. It's when we walk and we give and we are committed to the cause of Christ. Worship team, you can go ahead and come back. The third essential that we need to be a disciple, right? Number one, we need to die to ourself. We need to be committed to the cause of Christ and Number three, we find in Luke chapter 14, verse 31. It says this, it says, Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. 
won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? So the third essential that we need is to be Holy Spirit-led. We need to make sure that we're being led by the Holy Spirit. And here, this scripture, Jesus isn't enough one going to sit down and see like, hey, can we manage this battle with only 10,000 men coming against 20,000? See, the Holy Spirit's going to lead you. He's going to teach you. He's going to guide you if you allow him to. Do you allow the Holy Spirit to lead your life? When I think about essentially pieces of equipment, it comes to the compass. The compass guides you so that you know which way to go. Which way is north? Which way is north? Let me try to find it here. See, I'm already all turned around. There, that's north. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. It guides you. When you don't think you know where you are, it guides you. And I actually have a tattoo of a compass right here. And I got it because I don't want to ever forget who's leading me. I don't want to ever forget that who is my guide. My guide is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that's going to guide my life. The Bible says that it's going to teach me. It's going to help me. It's going to be a comforter. It gives you direction on where to go. It says that scripture, Jesus says, says the king is going to sit down and decide, am I able to win a war with 10,000 men? You see, there's a story back in Judges of a man named Gideon who was going to battle with 30,000 men against an army of close to 100,000, where God said, you know what, actually, that's, that's too many men. I want to make sure I get credit for the victory. And so through a long process, God whittles his army, Gideon's army, down to 300 men. And it was God that spoke to Gideon and said, don't worry, 300 men, you will come out victorious. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you and he says, hey, go this way. I know it doesn't make sense. Believe me, there was nothing militarily that made sense with Gideon going into battle with only 300 men. Nothing made sense at all. That that's what God asked him and spoke to him to do. And you know what? God's going to speak to you. The Holy Spirit's going to speak to you and ask you to do things sometimes that might just not make a whole lot of sense when, right at the beginning. But when you're obedient and you listen to him, see, the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you. And Jesus says this about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14, verse 26. He says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Man, we need to pay attention when the Bible says all. It says, I'm going to, the Holy Spirit will be my Father and will teach you all things. He's going to teach you all things. So when it comes to your spouse and your marriage, He's going to teach you exactly the way to treat your spouse. When it comes to parenting, man, God's going to give you the tools and the discernment to make the proper choices for your children, how to discipline them, how to raise them, how to teach them about God. He's going to teach you all things. Man, we need to make sure that we're being Holy Spirit led. You don't have to have it all figured out. The Holy Spirit will teach you along the way. We just need to make sure we get on the path, get on the journey, get going, get moving. The Holy Spirit will teach you as you go. And you know what else he does? (laughs) He nudges you when you get off track. And we all get off track sometimes, amen? The Holy Spirit, when you start to get off track, will kind of nudge you. Be like, hmm, yeah, you're not, you're not going north no more. Oh, Mike, yeah, that decision, no, no. Just need to kind of get back to north, and the Holy Spirit begins to nudge you back to the proper direction that you're supposed to go. We need to listen to that still, small voice. Listen to that nudging of the Holy Spirit. We have a helper 
that Jesus said will teach us everything that we need to know. And you know, early in verse 17, Jesus describes the Holy Spirit like this. He says, the spirit of truth, the world, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives in you and will be with you. So if you are a believer, instantaneously, when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit came and dwelled on the inside of you. He's in you. Now it's up to us whether we listen to him. I want you to go ahead and stand to your feet this morning. We're going to close with that song that we sang earlier. It's called Holy Spirit. That's exactly what we want. We want to make sure that we are being Holy Spirit led. We want to make sure that we're dying to ourself because we are selfish people. Let me tell you, I'm a selfish man. Like, I, it's something, Lord, that I, I need to daily, like, God, help me not be selfish. Lord, help me to die to myself. Lord, I want to be committed to the cause. No matter what the cost, I want to be committed. Lord, I want to be Holy Spirit led. We have those essentials in our lives, let me tell you. We are able to walk and carry our cross and be a disciple of Jesus. And when we are a disciple of Jesus, we'll change the world. And that's what we're called to do as believers. Amen? It's to change the world. So we're going to sing this song and just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you this morning. Maybe you need to work on one of those this morning. Maybe you need to die to yourself a little bit. Maybe be a little bit more committed to the cause that God is asking you to. And maybe you need to listen to the nudging, the leading of the Holy Spirit. So let's sing this song together. We'll be back to close in just a minute.
pray a prayer of blessing over you as we close this morning. And man, what an incredible reminder. It doesn't matter how long you've been serving the Lord. It doesn't matter how many years. It doesn't matter how many Sunday services you've sat through. There's still more of our lives that we need to give over to God. Amen, church? There's still more of him that we need, more of his presence, more of his Holy Spirit, more sensitivity to what the Holy Spirit is saying.